La mariposa ya llegó, la mariposa ya está aquí, oh, es para ti, yo sé que quieres bailar, me jala la mano, me dice pronto, me dice la nena y empieza a brincar, uh, la mariposa llegó, uh, la mariposa está aquí. A decade ago, when my family rode horses up the mountain in Michoacan, Mexico, to see the winter home of the monarch butterflies, we were greeted by an incredible sight. Tens of millions of monarchs, sheltered from the winter cold, and waiting to start their incredible migration. As the weather turned to spring, these monarchs would all fly north, but none of them would ever return. Instead, they'd lay eggs, and successive generations of monarchs would continue the full migration. The following fall, millions more monarchs, descendants of the butterflies all around us, would miraculously find their way back to this same spot, a cycle that has continued for untold centuries. Caught up in the wonder, we could never have imagined that just a decade later, North America's monarch population would have decreased by over 90%. Same meadow, 11 years later, where did all the monarchs go? Now citizens and scientists alike are asking the same question, what can be done to save the monarchs? The decline in monarch populations was first attributed to illegal logging in the reserves. It's a huge problem but the local communities have partnered with environmental nonprofits from Mexico, from the U.S., from Canada. Reforestation efforts are bringing the forest back. More trees means more cover for the monarchs. Comunidades que son los dueños de los bosques han convertido ellos en los protectores directamente de sus bosques, porque se han dado cuenta que no solo para la conservación de la monarca sirven estos bosques, sino para su mantenimiento propio. ¿Cómo está? Hi, we're at Crescencio Morales School with these great kids and their big tree nursery here and all the trees they're going to be planting out into the forest. And these kids are holding Oyamel firs, the trees the monarchs roost on in the winter. <laughs> I'm with Celia and this is her uh, energy efficient stove uh, built with uh, our friends at Alternare who do workshops on building these stoves in all the communities near the forest. And uh, that reduces harvesting of wood in the forest. Te gusta? Sí. Sí. With smaller numbers of monarchs in this area, they're more concentrated on fewer number of trees, so we have to go further up the mountain. It's a cool, cloudy day. The butterflies are huddled together on the trees, keeping each other warm. Conserving energy like this is how they're able to live through the whole winter and fly back to the United States. This is a super generation of monarchs. They live much longer than the other generations. We're here in Cerro Pelón. Uh, and we're, we're like 3,300 meters over sea level. And I see, I just saw an explosion there. It's beautiful, look at that. There's always some butterfly mortality. This guy might make it, or maybe not. But if a tagged butterfly dies, the tag might fall to the forest floor. We'll take that back to Monarch Watch. The log number in there can be traced back and uh, can find out where the butterfly was tagged somewhere north in the flyway. This is the male, you can tell by the pheromone dot. This is the female, and the mating can last six hours. After they mate, the female will fly north and find milkweed and lay eggs, 400 of them. So if a lot of monarchs move out of the reserves, there they go. If a lot of monarchs move out of the reserves, they can uh, expand their numbers greatly if they have milkweed. 
When these monarchs fly north on their migration, they only have a few weeks of energy left to find milkweed and lay eggs for the next generation. In northern Mexico and southern Texas, drought, heavy grazing, and a changing climate have significantly reduced milkweeds and pollinator plants. As they come out of those mountains, the monarchs rely on having milkweed across Tamaulipas, Coahuila, South Texas in February and March. So those monarchs that overwintered are finding almost no host plants. And now that first wave, they pretty much perish before they get out of that South Texas, Northern Mexico. So what you're gonna lose is the phenomenon of the migratory populations. This is Clepus viridis. This is a green milkweed and it has a rounded leaf. It grows rather prostrate. This is about as upright as it gets and then it just kind of sprawls out in the growing season. The hopes are when the monarchs are moving back from Mexico to Central Texas in the spring that they would be able to lay their eggs on the backs of the leaves of these when the egg hatches out into a caterpillar, the caterpillar has to eat only these leaves of milkweed. Three weeks goes by and the caterpillar morphs into another butterfly and it takes off and heads northbound to the corn belt. The further north they go, the more challenges the monarchs meet in finding milkweed to nurture the next generation. Industrial agriculture practices, the U.S. ethanol mandate, genetically modified crops paired with intensive use of herbicides and pesticides have combined to wipe out much of the milkweeds the monarchs depend upon. To save the monarch migration, we're going to need superhighways of milkweed and other native plants reaching far north across the United States and into Canada. That means planting milkweed in large patches everywhere of public and private land, parks, golf courses, on utility easements and at schools, Monarchs! Monarchs lay eggs all along their migration, so we're going to plant milkweeds and pollinator plants for butterfly food. When the milkweed leaves get eaten, look for monarch caterpillars. Monarchs are just one little indicator of a much larger problem. We're seeing the demise of the insect level of our food web that is crashing. There are 78 species of native bees in Texas. And so if you're doing something good for the monarchs, it's going to also be something good for the other native species. If future generations are going to know this beauty, it's up to each of us to do our part. <laughs>